the money matters. We've been doing this how long now? I can't even remember. It's been several years since we first came up with the idea. Um, so we do have handout notes, but it's not going to follow the material because we've done so many variations, permutations, and combinations that everything will get covered. Hopefully the material will be of use to you um, and uh, you'll get something out of it. Now, I should explain a couple of different things. Um, I have been doing business seminars for over 35 years. I'm not really a personal finance person, but I understand it really well. Um, I have nothing to sell you. In fact, it's not really legal for me to sell you anything. I'm not here to do anything but try to help you. Um, that'll be more important when we get into the next two sessions, which are on investment. Um, what else can I tell you? Um, a bit in, I've lived in, I'm not in Whistler tonight, but I have lived in Whistler for 11 years and apparently in 15 years, I will be a local. And my favorite story is one time when we were doing Money Matters, the first fellow who introduced himself when we were doing it live at the library mentioned how long he'd lived in Whistler. And every other person followed up. It's the only community in town who says, hi, and I've lived in Whistler for, and it's almost like a competition until we got to the last two ladies and they said, well, we're here from Calgary and we just thought this looked interesting. <laughs> But from wherever you are, wherever you're at, um, welcome. I'm here to share some ideas with you, some thoughts on the way money is and works. There'll be a little bit of psychology, a little bit of uh, economics, and things that will help you. Because my goal is not to tell you what to do. We know that telling adults what to do doesn't work. So I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm not going to tell you what to invest in. I'm not going to tell you how to spend your money but I'm going to explain how the system works because you're, you're grownups. And even if you were in high school, I'd do the same thing because understanding how things work will allow you to take the kind of actions that work for yourself. And that's what, what is important about your personal money situation. It is personal. And I respect that. That being said, I think, um, Jenna, in my notes, is my email information there? I believe it is. So a lot of times people aren't comfortable asking questions in front of a group of people and I respect that. If you have any questions, and that's the nice thing is we used to meet afterwards. Well, it wasn't technically a meeting. In fact, sometimes we'd get kicked out and talk on the sidewalk. Um, and, and, and I was able to ask answer questions live. But should you have any questions, please don't hesitate to send me an email. If it's fairly straightforward, I will send you a very poorly worded auto-corrected thing on my phone. Um, and if it takes a little bit more, I'll actually sit down and with a computer. And if you really, really decide to uh, make my life interesting, I'll have a spreadsheet. My goal is to go no later than 15 past eight, uh, allowing the last chunk of questions uh, because it's late and you're tired. And in fact, I know for a fact that some people are hungry because they are preparing dinner. So if you don't mind, I'm going to share the screen. Uh, and Jeanette has graciously me allowed to do so and I'm going to hit share and see if I can't figure out how this darn thing works. I don't do too badly for a, a baby boomer, I suppose. Of course, as I like to tell the Gen Xers, I did take my first computer science course in 1976. So I'm going to show you the four principles of finance, but tonight I want to introduce you to money, spending, and debt. That's my goal for, the, for this evening. Money does two things. It comes in and it goes out. There, now you're experts, any questions? So I like to look at it this way. Where does money come from? Well, in the top part of the box, I hope you can see the mouse, right in here, we earn money. And in earnings, I include earnings and entitlements. It's just, it's really hard to put earnings and entitlements into my pretty little graph. That's where the money comes from, from things such as earned income and you know money that's going to come into your business or sorry into your personal life i keep forgetting i just i i spent uh, six hours yesterday doing a finance seminar for business owners so i'm thinking in those terms the other place money comes from is we borrow it so it's really important that we understand earning and borrowing now once you've got the money you can do a couple things with it you can spend it or you can keep it 
And when I say keep it, that's kind of my broad way of saying, what are we going to do with the money that we choose not to spend? So I'm not just saying saving, and I'm not just saying investing. At this point, we're just staying with keep it. So those are the four cornerstones as I see personal finance. We earn, we borrow, we spend, we keep. And I know for any of you who are like me and I get really picky, you know, well, no, no. what about lawsuit settlements? Oh, okay, they're not in there, but you're gonna get money. Well, what about my inheritance? Oh, let's call that an entitlement. Uh, lottery winnings, don't usually recommend that as part of your RSP portfolio. But I like to keep things really simple. So before I want to talk about what we do with money, I want to quickly look at what money is. And money, money has three roles in our society. Money is, is a store of wealth. One Canadian dollar is worth one Canadian dollar by definition. It's a store of wealth. Now, the store of wealth can change. And that's why a lot of people don't consider cryptocurrency money because it's not a very good store of wealth because it changes so much in value. It's also a medium of exchange. That's just a fancy way of saying we can spend it. And again, it doesn't matter whether it's cash money, like real bills. I went to pay something in the, uh, uh, the Dublin gate the other day. I can talk about my local pub, can't I? Am I allowed to do it? If it's in Whistler? Yeah. So I went to actually pay real, real money. So if you can't, it disappears on the screen. Isn't it kind of amazing? a five dollar bill so you know the poor prime minister just vanishes kind of like ours today uh but you can spend money and and whether it's currency which by the way the fancy word for that is the m0 money supply or whether it's out of your checking account or your savings account it's a medium of exchange and that's primarily for many uh years what what money was about the third thing is is it's a measure of value how do we know what something's worth? We value it in dollars. And, and not to get too philosophical, I know that you know money can't buy happiness, you know, but poverty certainly seems to be able to buy misery. So it's kind of a funny juxtaposition. But we measure things in and we dollarize things. And maybe that's good and maybe that's not. That's a, a broader philosophical debate. But to be money, it's in these three areas. It's gotta be a store of wealth, medium of exchange, in a measure of value. And the reason it has to be all three things is because the second important tent peg I wanna put into the ground is different kinds of money. Now this is, the, it, China was the or origins of formal coin money. And what I found interesting when I was doing my research, see those little holes? Apparently the original Gucci bag was kind of like a wire and you strung your coins in the wire to keep your coins safe. And that's why there are holes in Chinese money. I thought that was kind of neat. One of the very first pieces of internationally circulating currency were the Spanish doubloons and what we call pieces of eight. Uh, back in the day, everything wasn't decimal, it was in eights. And in fact, back in the old days in the stock market, they would say it's at seven and three eights instead of uh, using decimals. But the Spanish currency was so well regarded that it could be spent anywhere. You didn't need to have just a piece of gold, the Spanish doubloon, Spanish pieces of eight. In Canada, in New France, they ran out of currency to pay the people. And they actually used playing cards signed by the manager of the fort as a means of paying the bills until the francs arrived from France. And, and the playing card money is, is kind of a, uh, an iconic piece of Canadian history. In fact, I believe that is from the, uh, the Canadian Mint Museum. Another thing is before we had a Bank of Canada, our chartered banks, which in fact are older than the country itself, issued their own currency. And I was able to find this again, courtesy of the uh, Canadian Mint, a Bank of Nova Scotia $100 bill. And because of the veracity of the Canadian banks, people trusted that as currency that could be spent just like anything else. Think of it as the difference between an IOU from Jimmy Patterson and an IOU from me. Which one do you think has more credibility? 
The American $100 bill is the single most important and common piece of currency in the world. It is used mostly as a store of wealth because it's the reserve currency of the world. And in fact, there are more $100 bills circulating that don't circulate than there are $1 bills and they get absorbed up. And in fact, there's a real push on reducing the value. In fact, I believe, don't, and I could be wrong, we used to have a $1,000 bill in Canada, by the way, but it's no longer in circulation. But I believe the highest currency note in the world today, there is a 500 euro note. But there's a real push by some economists to get rid of these large currency notes because a lot of times um, this level of cash is used for um, nefarious schemes. As any of you who may have watched the series Ozark may well know. Oh, by the way, if you have any questions on money laundering, don't ask me. I've never done it. <laughs> and finally, the most important piece of currency in existence that doesn't exist anymore, the Canadian Tire money, which to a certain extent is a medium of exchange. I don't know that it's really a very good store of wealth. Now, once we understand what money is, I've got another tent peg in the ground for you. And that is a really important one because these two terms get bandied about all the time. And politicians are really quick to change in midstream when they're talking about it. And that's the difference between wealth and income wealth and income. They are very different things. And yet it's interesting the way sometimes people will talk about wealth inequality and slip in issues of income inequality and vice versa. It's a little bit of a little bit of a sleight of hand that I've noticed sometimes. So it's really important that we understand this because we want to know what our objectives are. Income is a flow. You earn X number of dollars per year. Think of income as being Fitzsimmons Creek and think of wealth as being Green Lake. It flows. You earn money in a year. You could receive rent of $900 a year. Your stock pays a dividend of 308 a share. Whereas wealth is a snapshot of your financial situation at a given moment in time. You take your assets. That's just a fancy way of saying the stuff you own and you subtract any debts or liabilities. Those are the things we owe. And the difference is your net worth. So if you've got a house that you bought several years ago, your net worth has probably gone up. You get to pay more taxes, but your house didn't change at all. Whereas the income is that money that comes in through what you do. And they're very, very different. The key to financial independence or financial security if you're not going for complete independence. Although presumably one of our long-term goals is to become independent, independent enough to retire. Um, I don't refer to retirement savings. I just call it wealth building. What you choose to do with that wealth is completely up to you. But for most people, the act of wealth building is primarily for retirement, but not everybody. According to my son, any inheritance I get should be put into a trust for his great, great, great grandchildren. And the rest of us can just look at the balance. But my son isn't quite like everybody else. The key to building wealth is understanding your earning and your spending in order to keep money to allow it to build wealth in the long run. If you're not interested, if you're interested in living paycheck to paycheck forever, then you're probably not going to like a lot of what I have to say. But if part of your long-term plan is to build wealth, even if it's just the wealth you're building for your own retirement. So if your objective in life is to have the last check that you write bounce, and hopefully it's to the undertaker, that's fine too. But building wealth is what is required to get a sense of financial independence. Um, I, I like to use the example of who's rich, a little old lady with $30,000 a year in income, but a million dollar home, I guess I better update that, a $250,000 rift, $200,000 in investments, no debt, and net worth of 
$1.45 million or a young doctor just out of med school working at the hospital with $5,000 car and $110,000 in student loans and very little money in her checking account. Some people would argue that the doctor's rich because she has high income. Other people would argue little old lady in North Vancouver is rich. By the way, little old lady in North Vancouver is my mom and I did get her permission to use this. <laughs> um, but the point being is these are very, very different things. And so looking at your situation, you need to look at where you're at, where you want to be for yourself in your own life. So wealth and income are different. But if you play your cards correctly, wealth can generate income. And in some of our future sessions, I will show you some of the ways in which you can make that happen so that your earnings can come from your savings and from your investments. Keep forgetting where my mouse is. I'm going to quickly talk about earnings, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on earnings because later on when we talk about investing, I'll talk about investment earnings. But here are some of the different types of earnings. And as I say, earnings and entitlements. Um, it's interesting when we first started doing this, the objective was uh, we wanted to call it um, finance for millennials. And it turns out that that different age groups, we had one group and I'll bet you 50% of the people in the room had most of their questions about retirement savings um, and investing at in, in my age demographic. Okay, they were a lot younger than me, but let's not put too fine a point on that, shall we? Um, we have employment income. We have self-employment income. You've got your own business. Um, you can either pay yourself a wage or you can draw money as a proprietor. Um, you can get investment income, which can consist of interest, dividends, and capital gains. And again, in our, oh, I guess we'll probably touch on that in our March session. What month are we in? February. We have you on our March session. <laughs> you, know, you know, when we get more good snow. And then there are things that we call entitlements. And this is a broad term for things like pension. So if you're, if you're um, collecting your Canada pension or your old age pension, uh, gain perhaps, um, it could be a child tax credit. Um, if you've got uh, children. Uh, it could be things like child support. Um, it could be um, disability credits. But there are other forms of earning. And so people will, well, you're really earning it. So let's put that into the box with earnings and call it earnings and entitlements. Uh, and as I said, you know, as I've gotten older, I've started to realize, wait a second, I'm not going to, the only reason I get, I have, could, could get old age pension is, no, yeah, old age pension Actually, it's called old age security now. The only reason I can get that is because I had the brains not to die before turning 65. But that would be an entitlement, as is your CPP. And if you have a, a company pension, that would be the same type of thing. Um, actually, I should add one. Um, again, never ever thought that my age demographic would be taking that. But down the road, you may have income from um, uh, a, what's called a RIF. And that's a registered retirement income fund. And that's what you do with your RRSPs when you get older and want to start taking them out. And in fact, when you're 70 years old, all of your RRSPs must be converted into this thing called a RIF, an RRIF. I'm going to explain RIFs, TFSAs next time. By the way, if I inadvertently say next week, I don't really mean next week. I mean next month. Spending. So those are two things I want to talk about today is spending and borrowing. Okay. Any questions on money in general? This is your first checkpoint. By the way, don't worry about interrupting. If you were live, you'd interrupt me like crazy. Hey, Bill, shut up, slow down. Um, this do online thing is is quite it's quite different in terms of interaction. I, I, I will confess to you all, I am really looking forward. To seeing you in person. Although maybe everybody, now that you're so used to being able to turn your camera off, people will come with giant screens and just stick them in front of their faces. <laughs> well, you, you know. know, they'll still be wearing masks. So uh. well, yes. Yeah, but they'll still be there and we'll we'll be like a 
money bubble, I guess. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, folks, I will remind you that if you want to type a question in the chat, I am happy to read it out loud. Uh, oh, Megan says, I've actually, the bus got, strike is I've over actually by got my <laughs> chat. I've got my chat box open. Excellent. Oh, good. Yeah, you can I, see that's it. why with two screens. So I've got PowerPoint on one. I can see people's hmm. face. Well, I can see your face. And then I've got the, um, I've got, the, yeah, hoping the bus strike is over. I don't know if this started. <laughs> This Me was too. any place no, else? Anyway. <laughs> so with spending, and by the way, I'm not going to sit there and tell you not to have your, your avocado toast. That's up to you. But we've got three different kinds. We can generally put our spending into three different boxes. There's essential spending. And that's stuff that are commitments. You don't have a choice. You have to pay your rent. Yeah, You have to pay your cable. By all means, you have to pay Netflix. And if you don't like Netflix, it's probably Amazon. If it's not Amazon, it's probably Disney. And unfortunately, there's so many of the damn things, pretty soon it'll be more expensive than cable. But there are things that you are committed to spending. So as I like to say, your vacation may not be essential, but if you took out a loan for that vacation, it's essential. Once you're committed, it's essential. Then we've got non-discretionary spending. That's stuff that we need to buy. Why do I mean, doesn't everyone have four or five streaming channels? I only have three. <laughs> and one of them is somebody else's. Being single sucks. Uh, but non-discretionary spending, those are things we need to spend money on, but it's not necessarily a commitment. So we're going to spend money on food every month, but it's not like we subscribe to food. Although apparently with Amazon, you can. You can subscribe to anything with Amazon. Um but someone was telling me some people have a toilet paper subscription and, and like toilet paper just magically shows up on a regular basis. Um, it's, I guess, kind of a clever idea, but you better be very regular, um, you know, but non essentials to life, food, shelter, clothing, your ski pass. <laughs> Let's be honest. Let's look at where we are. Those are things that we are going to spend money on. Now, we can be careful with the way we spend money. And again, let's be honest, food has become very problematic for lots and lots of people. And many people are um, doing what we call in economics, a substitution. So a lot of people are eating less red meat, not to save the planet, but to save their pocketbooks, because um, beef especially has gone up. Whereas pork has stayed relatively, yeah, pork has stayed relatively less expensive. Chicken kind of goes all over the place. But chicken is covered by marketing boards, so it's a little bit different in terms of the market uh, than would be pork and um, uh, thing. Yeah, actually, I've just learned how to do a really nice pulled pork with a nice pork tenderloin, slow cooked. It's rather lovely. And then there's discretionary spending. And this is the spending which is not essential, and it's your choice. It's interesting how... Oftentimes, people that are very, very good with their essential and non-discretionary spending, when it's, when it's discretionary, just take off their I'm cheap caps and they go, we don't care anymore. Because there's a different psychological attitude towards spending. So here's my first rule. If you, in order to change your financial circumstances, you must begin with a complete understanding of your current situation. I work with business owners all the time and I challenge them on what they think is happening in their business and then do some analysis, analyses to find out what's really happening in their business. It's amazing how oftentimes where we think problems are, none exist. And yet at the same time, where we're not aware there's a problem, it's creating difficulties. The same thing can happen with your personal spending. So I used to teach marketing. So I'm taking a little bit of a marketing approach to personal spending. I'm going to show you the tricks that they use to take your money from you. Spending is amazingly psychological. And a big part of marketing is understanding the psychology of purchasing. In my real life, one of the areas in which some people think I know something, um, and that's really just because I fake it well, um, but I'm kind of an expert in price and price theory. 
I've done a lot of research in the area. I've read a lot of stuff. Um, behavioral economics came along and it just made my life wonderful. But I know some of the techniques that people use to move you to buy what they want you to buy. By the way, Resort Municipality of Whistler did a wonderful job on this. If you want to park in front of the library, it actually costs you more per hour to park for longer. At one time, you could park up to four hours, and they thought they made it very expensive. People just paid the money, and so they reduced it to two hours only. From an economics point of view, what they should have done is they just should have increased that three and four hour rate outrageously. But it was one of those cases, instead of the more you buy, the less you pay, the more you buy, the more you pay. Because the objective, the strategy was to get people to move. We can use things like pricing, things like promotion to move people. These are the techniques people are using on you. And the, one of the things that they do, and this goes back, DISC is based on Jungian personality for any of you with psych backgrounds and was popularized in the, um, I believe in the 1920s. And it is the forerunner of things like Myers-Briggs. And different people respond differently to um, stimulus based on their personalities. And in fact, what was that, that one that Facebook got in trouble with? Um, where, where What they were trying to do is see if they could use somebody's profile to extract their personality quadrant and use their knowledge of the personality quadrant to impact their voting behavior. Um, uh, was it Cambridge Analytica? That was it, Cambridge Analytica. And it was a big to-do. Truth of the matter is, they were never able to, be, to extract somebody's personality type simply by looking at their profile. The experiment, in fact, failed. Um, but that was the big controversy with Cambridge Analytica. The direct personality style is, I want it, I want it done, I want it now. These are the people that love their Amazon Prime. They're the people that think, hey, I need such and such, and they order it, and it gets there the next day. My son is a prime example of that. Um, I swear the Amazon person could be a dependent from a tax point of view. There is somebody at my son's house, and they think nothing of ordering the smallest item because everybody in that it, it's like it's like the olden days when we had a milk person and they had a root i swear the amazon man has a root in my son's neighborhood but that type of personality tends to be very impulsive and they tend to buy those impulse items that's why when stores merchandise they always put nice little impulse items right near the cash area um he was great for that. Is it fresh market? Because they root you through the little maze to, to, to get to the cash. And if you're, if, you're, if you're in the express lane, you have to go buy a bunch of impulse items before you pay. And people will actually do that. Um, in, in the US, where convenience stores also sell beer and wine, they have the beer at the back of the store. And then you turn around and what do you see immediately? All the salty snacks. Well, I've gone in for beer. Yeah. We could use some chips. We could use some Doritos. We could use some pretzels or whatever it happens to be. And the direct personality doesn't think twice about making that extra, um, that extra uh, purchase. Or maybe you're more the influential. You know, let me tell you what happened to me. Let me tell you the story. These are the kinds of people that marketers love because marketers not only love customers, they love loyal customers, but there's this creme de la creme in the world of marketing. They're called advocates. And they're the kinds of people that not only buy the product on a regular basis, they tell all their friends and their friends are influenced by that. They love the how the store, how the uh, product, how the brand makes them feel. The steady eddies, these are the accountants and engineers of this world. Can you provide me with documentation? And these are the people that actually read instruction manuals and the backs of the label. And again, if I'm trying to get those people, I give them information where you can get more information, where you can get more information on where I got the information. But the way in which those people are sold to is fundamentally different than, say, the influential.
And then there's the compliant, the very community oriented group of people. These are people for whom shop local campaigns are extraordinarily successful because it's about the team. It's about the us. It's, it's the, you know, team Canada, you know, they're, they're the people like me that bought everybody. They knew Lululemon socks and hats for Christmas because they had the Olympic ones. I don't know why, but I, I wanted to do that. But the point is, is, is different people buy things differently. Now, why am I telling you this? Am I telling you this so you can go out and make a lot of money in marketing? Well, God bless you if you do. But when you're self-aware, ask yourself the question, what are some of the techniques based on my personality that may be influencing me to purchase things that I don't necessarily need? Um, one of the uh, well, I can't, sorry, I can't remember the book, but it was one of the Living a Simpler Life and Decluttering books, um, had a really interesting exercise. And you were supposed to go through your drawers and your closet and pile, put into piles and anything that you haven't worn in six months goes in one pile and anything you wear on a regular basis goes on another pile. Now, I don't exactly know what would happen if you did this in the summer and it had been over six months of ski season. But the point was, is that when we look at our wardrobes as a whole, it's that good old 80-20 rule. We tend to wear the same things over and over and some things sit in the back of the closet. And yet a lot of people go out with great intentions and they buy this stuff and they find they never use it. And more and more people are starting to become very aware, especially with clothing, um, that we should buy less things that we need higher quality and keep them for longer and in fact there is a backlash now against the whole fast fast fashion movement try saying that quickly three times how do you buy how do you buy this should be in your notes i'm going to let you look at this i'm i'm all I'm not super pressed for time, but I mean, good heavens, I don't want to have too much fun when we're going to be talking about lending and banking soon. But that driver type of personality, their buying style is they make fast decisions, love to negotiate. And for a lot of people, they see buying as a game. Uh, these are the people that are often the, 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 the negotiating bargain hunters, and they don't care about the 10 cents. It's the fact that they got the 10 cents that's important. And it's, again, very much a game. The status-oriented people, that's that influential group. And they often make fast decisions, but they make them very emotionally. Um, and, I, you know, they love the brand. They're very much about the brand. And, I mean, if, if I'm glad we're not live because, you know, when in Whistler, one can always throw out the... Are you a North Face person? Are you a Arteryx person? Are you one of those spider people? And it's amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm not even going on ski brands because I don't want to get beaten up. It's amazing, though, how loyal people are to their brand. For some reason, I started buying North Face and I kind of became a North Face person. I'm sure other brands are good. But if I have to get something, my first instinct is to go back to North Face. There's no reason for it. It's not logical. It's just what I'm used to. Arteryx, see, there. now we've got the Arteryx people. Um, uh, uh, why, are, oh, why are essentials? Um, uh, it's, it's, it is, food and clothing are essential, but sometimes they aren't. Um, rent and hydro, you're committed to. So your, your hydro bill, you must pay either on the equal payment program or based on what you use, you are committed. You have a contract for that. Food and clothing, you don't have to buy the same food all of the time. So you have some control, even though it's essential. You have some control over it. Um, that's where I would argue that all of your cable bills, they're, um, they're, they're, you're spending that all the time. So it's, it's, it's a question of degree. Do you need it? Do you not need it? But are you committed to it? You can be committed to buying stuff because of contract. And it, one of the most amazing things with, especially things like uh, Netflix is they'll give you your free month. 
And what happens is it's a very small amount. So people kind of forget about it. And what's fascinating with Netflix is they've been creeping up slowly. And I've heard that in the US, Amazon Prime has already gone up and it rumored to go up in Canada. Now that becomes something we're committed to, not because we have to, but because we're so used to it. And we don't think for one minute, well, do I really need all of them? Um, it's the level of the commitment that changes the way in which you can change the spending. Uh, so with hydro, really, there's there's no other game in town. Although a buddy of mine uh, using solar panels, um, uh, he uses the program that uh, you can uh, load up credits to hydro if you don't use as much and you put it up into the grid. He says it's the cheapest. It's a $7 or $6 a month storage fee. And he's actually electrically positive this year. He, he will be positive. He's got that much in... Um, um, in solar panels, the other thing he started doing was he obsessively and compulsively monitored every day. And he found out the difference between using the oven and the toaster oven and the instant pot. And he was actually able to change the way he cooked in order to save hydroelectric power. And what happens is you measure it, you get done. He says, even if I don't measure it, I've changed some of my buying behavior, some of my consumption behaviors because he wanted to win some power smart comp competition. So even with the, and that is something I would consider as one of these, it's non-discretionary essential. By the way, clothing is, is always the controversial one. We can't run around naked, but on the other hand, how much of what we buy is essential? And that's, that's I mean, it's a question of degree. What's essential for you? You know, with the Arteryx Lifetime Guarantee, you buy it once and you never have to buy another one. You will be wearing the same ski jacket for the rest of your life. <laughs> Till one of your kids says, are you going to get rid of that anytime soon? Um, uh, security people, that's the steady group of people. They're interested in making the right decisions. They are the rational purchaser. It's funny, though, sometimes I've met some really rational purchasers that have their thing that they're irrational about. Uh, I knew a, a fellow who wouldn't spend top dollar on anything except golf clubs. When it came to golf clubs, he wanted the best. It was his choice. But it was very fascinating to, to hear the way he'd go on about golf compared to any other expended item in the world. Um, um, they will use things like reviews, consumer reports. Um, uh, the reviews on Amazon, uh, that type of things. Although apparently they have become so uh, tainted uh, as to be next to useless, uh, apparently, is what I've heard. Oh, somebody's connecting to audio. KW. I'm just, I mean, there might be a question coming. Hello. Oh, no. Okay. Um, Belonging or association people, they like what's popular, what's in. They don't want to stand out from the crowd. Um, belonging people are rarely early adopters. And I could go into all the neat things about early adopting if this was a marketing seminar. I love marketing. I, I teach a lot of finance, but actually marketing was my first love when I was doing seminars. Um, and uh, they're really affected by origin stories. They love origin stories. Um, they're the people that when you, you know, there's a bottle of wine that's got the story of the winery on the back. Go, oh, this is just great. Oh, I want more of these people stuff. It's so good because they're relating to the people. So what, but the important takeaway from a consumer spending point of view is to ask yourself the question, how is this affecting me? So you know, one of my favorite buying tips is you know, 43 people only shop at one grocery store. And a lot of people shop at two for different kinds of groceries. When people go grocery shopping, they park their car in the same place. If not in exactly the same spot or the same row, it's always on the same side relative to the entrance of the supermarket. If it isn't, you lose your car. Um, if there are two entrances, and again, nowadays there aren't, everybody's being rooted through the same entrance and exit, um, you always go in the same entrance. Um, you may have different things in your, in your um, cart, but most of your cart is the same every time you do your different grocery shops. Though I do believe uh, you know, people are substituting based on price. 
But that's only because we've gone so long without inflation. Now we're really seeing the impact of inflation. Those kinds of impacts are habit changers. Anything traumatic like that is a habit changer. You know, it's just like, you know, I used to pay X number of dollars for roast beef. Good heavens, now it's a lot more expensive. So what do you do? Maybe you get a slightly smaller roast or maybe you uh, go from a pork roast to, or a, a, a beef roast to a pork roast. Because things have changed, it shakes us out of our buying habits. And in fact, in many ways, that can be a good thing. Um, most people follow the exact same route through a grocery store. And in fact, if they start moving stuff in the grocery store, people get mad. And I mean, if you don't have the lineup where they want, you will often gravitate to the same cash register, not the same cashier, same cash register. So th here's three little rules that I stole from a guy named Mr. Money Mustache. And he's one of these guys who's the kind of into the uh, fire uh, movement, which is um, uh, financial independence, retire early. And, and a lot of people are saying, forget the retire early. The financial independence is, is the important thing. And what they did, he and his wife looked at things and they said, we're, we're spending a lot of money that's a waste. And so he kind of went all the way the other way and became sort of the deal hunter of the world. Mr. Money, it's worth looking at. It's kind of fun. And he says three pieces of advice. Piece of advice number one, Hello? don't buy stuff you don't need. That's the beauty of Zoom. People come back. I home. agree. <laughs> I'm doing a workshop. You can come join me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> he says, hit number two, look for deals. But by the way, I had my helmet and goggles stolen. I had to pay full retail for a new helmet and new goggles. I can't believe how much that stuff cost if it isn't turkey sale. And finally, don't buy stuff you can't afford. One of the sad commentaries, and I say this is a scum sucking capitalist pay, but one of the sad commentaries on our consumer economy isn't that people buy stuff. It's when people feel compelled to buy stuff. Now, all of a sudden, your spending is controlling you. You're not controlling your spending. If you want to change, you must take control. If you don't want to change, don't take control. But if you truly want to change on spending, take control. So here's, here's some, some, some tips from me to you. If you don't hear a word I'm saying, hear these ones. This is the most important thing I will ever tell you. I will ever share with anybody. Where is my, what? no, no, that's all I'm looking for. Where's my anode? Oh, sorry. Oh, can't find it. Oh, well, I guess it isn't here. Uh, I was gonna show you something, but there's a thing and, and it's, it's funny. I, I read about this reverse, budget. I thought, oh, this is cool. I should share this and money matters. It turns out I already was. It's just a spending log. Track everything you spend. And the beauty of, um, of buying things with your debit or your credit card is it checks for you. And some of the banks have really good programs that will track your spending. Um, with Royal Bank, I think it's called Nomi. Uh, there's one with TD. Um, uh, I do my business banking with them, so I don't use it but it can give you a sense of where your money, and hey, let me tell you where this really ha help, was helpful for me. It picked up on the fact that I had two identical charges at the same time from the same store. And what had happened is the first time I tapped, it said I didn't go through. So I inserted my card and it actually did charge me twice. I would never have noticed had the bank not informed me of it. So I went to the merchant and was able to prove it. They, they were happy to give me a credit. Don't start doing a budget until you do your spending log. Because that's going to tell you how you really spend money, not how you think you spend money. Write it down. I spent this much on this, this much on that. Put it into groupings that make sense to you. Some of them you won't be able to control because they're, they're fixed. They're going out every month anyway. Car payment. Some of them you can change, even if they're essential spending, because you can buy differently. But whatever it is, get a sense of where you're spending and how you're spending. Because it gives you the ability to start to take 
control. One of the things that we have noticed in personal um, expenditure is people, and, and again, COVID was tough. Let's be honest. For a lot of people, COVID was tough. For a lot of people, a lot of people saved money during COVID because they were making money and they didn't have any place to spend it. But for a lot of people, COVID was tough. And what happens is when things get overwhelming, people go, I can't do anything about it. So they actually get into worse habits. Uh, it, it, it's, spending and dieting are actually psychologically have a lot of similarities to them. But once you've got a budget, I strongly recommend that you set savings and debt reduction goals, if that's an issue. And, it, you know, here's my recommendation order for your life. Pay down high interest debt first. By the way, there is another school of thought that says not to do that, but to pay off your smallest debts first so you can feel you've paid something off. But I'm a math nerd, so I have to do it the other way. Um, try to get an emergency fund together. Um, it's amazing the number of Canadians that, that do not have that. Um, savings for specific things should be separated from savings for your long-term wealth building. So if you're saving money to go on a vacation, good, great, that's great. Better than putting it on your credit card, but that's not wealth building. In fact, I know some people that instead of taking out a car loan, they make their car payments before they buy a car. They have a sign, they put their car payment as if they were making a car. They, so they keep driving the junker, they put the car payment away and they actually save up enough money and they buy their cars cash. They don't like making payments. I'm not saying you should do that. I'm saying you should do what works best for you. Um, once you've got your bad debt, and I'm gonna explain 50 shades of debt before we leave. I'm just taking a boot at the clock here. Okay, I'm on time. Um, make sure that once you've got that bad debt and the in emergency fund controlled, start to invest. And we're gonna talk about investing. And I'm gonna show you some ways that you can invest without a great deal of help, very solid ways to invest that you can invest in very small amounts. And you can invest with very little, or actually there's one way to invest that has no fees whatsoever. So you can do it. A lot of people think it's this really weird, hard, complex, I can't do this thing. And in fact, there are simple strategies that you can employ that will help you over the long term build wealth. So that's what I'd suggest for getting started. If your situation is really, really bad, uh, you should consider credit counsel. Um, if, and if, if, uh, if, your, if your financial situation is primarily caused due to high debt, um, and again, with, with COVID, a lot of people um, have, have some issues and they weren't their fault. I mean, <laughs> it wasn't your idea to have the economy shut down. Credit counseling is something that you may need to consider. Uh, I have no experience in it. I've not done it, but I do know that it exists. And what will happen is the credit counselor will take information, go to your creditors and uh, negotiate for a discount, a discounted amount on what you will repay, if anything at all. It beats the heck out of uh, bankruptcy. Bankruptcy is actually fairly expensive. Uh, you can be too poor to go bankrupt. I know that sounds like an oxymoron, but in fact, it is true. Oops. Borrowing. Any questions on spending? It's not my field of expertise, but I, I knew I needed to touch on it before I got into um, borrowing, which I know is really boring, but borrowing is a key pillar. But any questions on spending? Any of you got any great tips? Besides us, Jeanette, to invite you over for dinner at least twice a week. Oh, did I say that out loud? I was just seeing if you were paying attention. Uh, you know, Bill, Bill, I should just chime in and say how many of your tips from that section I have applied in my own life and they have worked very well. So give me, what do you think number one is? What would you, you're, you're telling some person what worked best for you? Well, I, I'll tell you from, from that list that you just talked about, I did the thing where I paid off high interest loans or debts first, and that really worked for me. Um, 
so that one definitely love that you also recommended m maybe you'll talk about this later but you also recommended um switching to a lower interest credit card in that in that yep. instance as well We're talk about that too i yep. did that 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 served me very well um something else that you're going to mention later which i also did was um when you get a little bonus money always pay yourself first a little bit and then put the rest of it away yeah because you'll feel bad about it if, <laughs> if you yeah. don't i still do that one as well that, that that was that was a piece of advice that was actually given to my son uh, my son is uh in film and television uh he's he's a stuntman um and what would happen is is when you get a big project you get a boatload of money and so a lot of the kids would go out and they'd, they'd, they, it was like found money and they'd spend it. Well, of course, they didn't realize that this was going to change their tax situation. So they didn't put any money away for taxes. And somebody gave him the piece of advice. He says, when you finish, it, especially a movie um, or end of a TV, um, end of a season for TV, he says, get yourself a present. So then you feel, oh, yeah, that, that, that's what I got for doing that show. But then you don't. Can I say, I, well, this is a library. Aren't we supposed to have freedom of speech? You know, I'll use dad's term. You don't piddle it away. So my dad would say, don't piddle it away. Because I'm trying to be good and, and, and family friendly and stuff. Um, but yeah, little common sense things. By the way, you know, it, like anything, you'll try and sometimes you'll fail and you'll get, you know, go back into habits. We are very habitually driven. And spending and eating and exercising and all those things are very habit oriented and it's hard to break habits. So if you try and fail, admit it, back to the drawing board, try again. The younger you are, the longer you have to fix your mistakes. Um, if I was doing a seminar for people my age, I would be giving you a whole lot of different messages. but. Um, since I can't see any of your faces, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, because uh, the, the finance for seniors has got some um, very unique and different pieces to it. Borrowing. So where does money come from? We earn it because we're talking about where money comes from tonight. We borrow it. Borrowing can include things like student loans, debt service, mortgages, leases, car payment. You must know both your debt, that's how much you owe, and your debt service, how much has to go in every month just to keep the wolves from the door. That, how long it's going to take to pay that debt off is a function of how long, that's called the amortization period, and the interest rate. Now, some interest rates change frequently. Mortgage rates, you know, when mortgage rates go up, mortgage rates go down. You know what's really interesting? When interest rates went down, credit card rates didn't change. When credit card, when interest rates went up, credit card rates didn't change. The only time your credit card rate changes, if you stop paying the minimum payment, they will actually take your credit card rate from the balmy 19.99% up to 24. 4.99%. Now, I'm not again, I'm not one of these people that's an anti-credit card person. Um, I use my credit card all the time, but you must use credit cards like all credit, you must use it wisely. So I want to talk a little bit about borrowing money. Here's some interesting bits about interest. This is the math nerd in me speaking. There's a concept in um, finance called present and future value. Present value is what something is worth today. Future value is what it would be worth in the future. What would it take for you to give up $10 today to have an amount in one year from now? Because you don't have that $10 to spend. That concept, by the way, and this won't be on the final, is called time preference for money. That's, that's the economic term for it. Compound interest is the idea of paying or receiving interest on the interest. So it compounds. Um, an annuity is a set 
number of payments every month, week. I guess you could have a daily annuity. I've never heard of one, but in theory, you could have one. It's that flow going out or coming in. So what some people do when they retire, instead of getting a RIF, I mentioned that just briefly earlier, you can get an annuity. And that annuity, which is based on your age, um, and um, I think I'm using the right term. I think it's based on sex, not gender. Am I using that term correctly? Um, if, if you are male, you get more because you are going to die sooner. So if you look up annuity tables, life annuity tables, there will be um, for women, there will be one for men, and there will be one that's called joint life. So, so if it's a couple, the last survivor will, will, will die. Those are called life annuities. But an annuity is no different than a loan payment. It's just in the opposite direction. So I'm getting money to me. You can buy an annuity. You can buy a 10-year annuity. Uh, in the United States, a lot of their lotteries are um, in the form of an annuity, not in the form of um, uh, a lump sum cash payment. You have a choice between the two. Now, this is the most amazing mathematical concept you will hear in finance ever. It's called the rule of 72. The rule of 72 tells you how long it takes for something to double or the interest rate required to double something in a certain amount of time. It's amazing. Um, so with the rule of 72, just let me go back here, sorry. Rule of 72, if I have $1,000 invested at 10%, I go 1,000 um, uh, uh, divided by, uh, sorry, 72 divided by 1,000. I think I've got that right. And it'll double in 7.2 years. It take, at 10%, things double in 7.2 years. At 7.2%, they double in 10 years. I did the math on credit cards. If you have a credit card, and you didn't put anything else on it, but you didn't make any payments. It only takes about 3.6 years for your debt to double. So all of a sudden you're paying more, more debt on the interest and it spirals. Later on, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about just the, these, these um, uh, payday lenders and their ridiculously high interest rates and how quickly you get to a point where you're paying more on the interest you've accrued than you are on your original debt. It's not a lot different than a mortgage. Back when interest rates were higher, I mean, I can remember my first mortgage was 10.5% and thought we died and gone to heaven because it had come down from 12, just on under 12%. And it took years before every payment had an equal amount of interest and principal. In the early days, it was mostly interest. With interest rates being a lot lower, it actually doesn't take as long to at least be at a, being at a point where it's 50% interest and 50% principal. But your debt at 20% will double in just over three years. So it's very important to control debt and especially make sure you're not paying too high an interest rate. Here's some different kinds of interest rate. A savings rate is the amount of interest you receive when you put money in the bank, which is called next to nothing. Um, but again, as interest rates begin to rise and, and most economists predict interest rates will begin to rise, it will almost be worthwhile saving again. A lot of people say one of the biggest victims of the financial crisis were older seniors because they tended to put their money into savings accounts as opposed to investments. And so they were getting next to nothing. So the borrowers were the winners, but the savers were the losers. A mortgage rate is the interest you receive when uh, borrowing against your home or for a home. And again, they're very, very competitive. Always shop around um, if you're getting a mortgage. I highly recommend 
from a lot of people, use a mortgage broker. And there are mortgage brokers in Whistler. Uh, but use a mortgage broker because they can go to non-traditional lenders. And every once in a while, you know, they've got too much money. There's a lot of money floating around out there. And they'll actually have a sale on money. I know that sounds really an, an odd concept, uh, but there'll be a sale on money. Um, the bank rate, and you probably hear a lot about the Bank of Canada and moving the bank rate or the Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve rate. That's the amount that the Bank of Canada would charge one of our chartered banks, but it forms kind of a benchmark for interest rates in Canada because that impacts the prime rate and the prime rate is the rate at which chartered banks will lend to their best customers. And many loans, so a variable rate mortgage is often at prime plus or prime minus something. As is if you have a mortgage-backed line of credit, it's based on the prime rate. And some banks base it on their own prime rate. It's amazing how many prime rates are the Royal Bank's prime rate. It's the Royal Bank of Canada that's, that sets the prime rate. And when interest rates begin to go up, the prime rate will immediately begin to rise. And, and there are a lot of economists worried that if the Bank of Canada raises interest rates too quickly, it could cause a world of hurt. Now, in Canada, we tend to pick our mortgage rates on a fixed basis. I believe now the five-year mortgage is the most popular in the country. But in many countries, they use variable interest rates. Um, so again, it's so important that you understand your situation and what your risks are when it comes to uh, borrowing and when it comes to lending. Now, this is just a really simple illustration of a very important concept in the world of business finance. Once you understand this, not the arithmetic, understand this in your heart of hearts, finance makes a lot more sense. And that is the idea that at uh, 6%, $1,000 today, is equal to $1,060 in six months and is the same thing as an annuity of 8607 every month for 12 months. Those are the same thing. They don't add up to the same thing. $1,000 isn't equal to $1,060. But once you see that concept as being the same, you'll get an annuity is no different than a lump sum today and a lump sum today that I don't spend is a lump sum tomorrow that I may spend or that I may choose not to spend. And what you'll find happening is at the beginning, it starts off slowly. But as you continue saving, your interest begets interest or your dividends beget dividends. So if you're a dividend investor, sometimes you can have a program where they automatically reinvest the dividends and you're always buying more of the stock every single quarter. And in fact, with some exchange traded funds, you can do that every single month. I'll show you some examples. But the idea that an amount today has a different value than an amount in the future, and that an amount being paid out has a different, uh, uh, or has a similar value or, or identical value, it's really important to understand because it is the foundation of wealth building. And by the same token, when you're out of control with debt, it's wealth destroying. So when we borrow money, we receive it today, a present value. I borrow $1,000, I'm going to make monthly payments. Or in a balloon payment, I borrow the $1,000, I don't do anything, and in a year from now, I pay $1,060. Sometimes the balloon works slightly differently. I borrow $1,000, but I don't get $1,000. I get 900 and some odd dollars, and in a year, I have to pay $1,000. That's the way payday lending works. When you go to a payday loan and you borrow $100, they give you, I think it's $96 or $97. And when you get paid, they take 100. And so it looks like it's only three bucks. 
But in fact, that $3 on $100, which is 3%, is only for a week or two weeks. Well, if it's only for a week, that's 3% times 52. So we're talking interest rates of, of, of 150% that are compounding. And so what a lot of people will do, I, I, I'm going to talk about that later, but payday lending, just like I get the need for it, but um, they are bringing in some legislation, but uh, they're not as popular here, but apparently in the United Kingdom, there were real problems with payday lenders. And a little trivia for you, the word mortgage comes from the old French for death pledge. It could come up on Jeopardy and you could go, hey, I know the answer to that question. Good heavens, I'm almost dead on time. Let's talk about what else is critical. It, because you know, in, in our modern society, it, it's difficult, not impossible, but it's difficult to go through life without borrowing money. So, so what do banks consider? Well, one of the things they look at is your credit rating or your credit history. And there are credit agencies that give you a score. I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. They look at your current income. First thing the bank wants to know is, do you have the means by which to pay me back? Banks don't want to go and foreclose and sue you and kick you out in the snow and take your house. They don't enjoy that. Okay, they hire a few people that do, but by and large, they don't get their money back. They want their payment. They'll also look at your net worth. Um, um, some of you may have seen that ad uh, for capitaldirect.ca. And what they do is they lend solely on the value of a home. Um, they, they look less or not at all at your current income. It's purely based on your net worth. Um, your security or unsecurity, unsecurity um, makes a difference. So the reason um, it's so inexpensive to borrow against your home is because the home is considered to have a high security value. Whereas if you take an unsecured loan, that means it's not secured against a specific asset, it's just against your reputation you'll pay a much higher interest rate. Uh, the exception to the rule is it's kind of odd is car loans because quite often car loans are subsidized by the, um, the manufacturer in order to incentivize you to purchase the vehicle. And they'll either do that through a loan or through a lease. And a lease is in fact a loan. It's just that with a, a car lease, you don't pay it off. You pay it to a certain point and that's the buyout for your lease. And whether leasing is better, it, it really depends. If you're the kind of person that buys and keeps cars forever, you're better off buying. But if you're the kind of person that knows that you want a new car every, you know, three, four, five years, and that making a car payment is just part of having a car, it's part of your monthly expenses, you like having a car, you know, they don't break down as much, then leasing is probably for you. It depends on your circumstance and your situation. I'm one of these people that I hate making payments. I hate feeling obligated. I buy my cars for cash and I keep them for a long time. So I hope I like them. Um, my thinking now with electric cars, because they're gonna be uh, the kinds of cars that'll last a lot longer. Um, my next car, which I'm hoping is gonna be electric, may be the last car I ever purchase. And again, your credit score, which I put in twice. Now here's how banks work. Reader's Digest version of how banks work. And then we'll get into 50 shades of debt and I'll send you on your way. So we start a bank, the bank has capital called the reserve ratio. So if we have $100,000, we can go out and borrow a million dollars at a 10% reserve ratio. So we have the million dollars, we borrow that million dollars. That's what depositors do. They lend money to the banks. Now, not all of the bank's money comes from individual depositors. They go out onto money markets and they borrow money from other institutions, pension funds, uh, people like that. In fact, sometimes, and I, this was really kind of interesting, is when your money's not working at night, they send it overseas to work for nine hours or so, and then they ship it back. And this, this is called borrowing on, they call the overnight market. Um, there was a bank, Northern Rock in the United Kingdom, that lent mortgages, and they got their funding through the overnights 
And all of a sudden there were rumors that they were having trouble and nobody would lend the money anymore. And all of a sudden, and it was really quick. Northern Rock was insolvent, even though their mortgage portfolio was quite good. Their source of money was so short term that when people stopped giving them that money, and you I mean, it's like thinking about it, you're reapplying for a loan every single night. And all of a sudden, Northern Rock didn't have sources of funds. So banks lend money to you, to me, to businesses, to um, institutions. And they charge an interest rate. The difference between what they pay and what they receive is the net interest income. And in Canada, that's around three and a half to four percent. It's gone down quite a bit because Canadian banks are, are huge mortgage lenders. Um, the bulk of, of banks' assets are actually uh, tied up in mortgages. They, they, they have a lot of money in mortgages. And uh, unlike the credit crisis in the United States, when Canadian banks lend you money, uh, they keep the debt. They don't sell that paper on, which is what happened in the US. Um, so the difference is about 4%. Now, they also get money from fees and service fees and um, uh, foreign exchange. They have a lot of money on foreign exchange. Now, I'm talking about the retail side of banking. I'm not talking about the investment side. Um, you know, making money from selling mutual funds, exchange traded funds, um, personal banking, that's a different arm. Um, uh, arranging you know, bonds. I'm talking about what we call retail banking. So they make about 4%. No, they make it on billions and billions of dollars. So don't feel too badly for the Royal Bank of Canada. So they pay their staff they pay their costs because remember the net interest income, we've already paid the interest on the money we've borrowed, but they also incur bad debts. So one of the exercises I used to do uh, when I was uh, teaching a, a business finance course is we'd sit and we'd start a bank. I've, I've done that at the library too. We've, we've started the Shredder Bank of, of Whistler. And I'd ask people on average, what percent of loans go bad? And they say, oh, yeah, it's got to be about 10%. If it was 10%, the banks would go bankrupt. Canadian banks, and, and all banks, but Canadian banks are especially this way. They are a low-risk, low-margin business. They don't like taking a lot of risk, but they actually don't make a lot of margin. Don't feel sorry for them, because one, their um, they're finance arms, like personal finance, um, commercial deal making makes quite a bit of money on top of the bank's profits, but their volumes are so large that they make a great deal of money. Canadian banks, what do they call it? A, a well-protected oligopoly, um, which is why I'm a big fan as an investor of Canadian banks. Um, the history of the Bank Act is quite fascinating. It's redone every 10 years um, and no one individual can own more than 10%. It's the Canadian banks interested in their own way, whether it's individual investors, institutional investors, including your pension funds, are owned by the people of Canada. Oh, let's see what am I doing here? So, and I think I've got this in, in the notes, uh, your credit scores and really credit score is an overall, here's what we want for you to be happy. It's funny. Banks actually don't like people with too good a credit history because they have a tendency to pay their loans off quickly and the bank doesn't get their uh, administrative costs back. Uh, they actually like people just a little bit lower, uh, but they also don't want to lend to people that have very poor credit. One of the pieces of advice that I give to um, all young people, um, get a credit card as soon as you can with a low limit and put one recurring expense on your credit card. So let's say for sake of argument, it's your cell phone. Put your cell phone on your credit card. They take the money, you pay off your credit card, pay it off every month. It is one of the easiest ways to build a good credit history is having a good record of paying. Now it's great to pay Rogers, but it's even better 
if you're paying off a credit card. The other thing is, is when you have the opportunity to take out a loan, pay it back. You can start building excellent credit as soon as you're of legal age. And I highly recommend that people do that. Now, is debt good or is it bad? It's neither. Like fire, it can keep you warm and it can burn your house down. And that was an awful cliche. It's still the best one that comes to my mind, but it's still an awful cliche. So at the top of the heap in 50 shades of debt, the best debt is deductible debt. And that's borrowing money to make an investment. It's also called leverage. I am going to explain leverage in our April session. It's funny, it can be a really good idea, but because of the risk, I personally don't do it. But I know people that do. The next one is student loans. It's, it's I call it kind of off-white because student loans in Canada at least give you a tax credit. So if you have a car loan and you have a student loan, I still recommend paying off your car loan first. Now you do want to get that student loan paid off. But there are other debts I would pay before the student loan. The next thing is a mortgage. That's kind of like gray debt. And very few people can save up enough money to buy a house for cash, especially in today's world. It's not deductible in Canada. It is in other jurisdictions. But for the most part, you're buying an appreciating asset. And you'd have to spend the money anyway because you have to have some place to live. Uh, somebody brought a really interesting point, uh, atten point to my attention just the other day. It used to be it was cheaper to rent than it was to buy. Now, if you've got the down payment, it can be cheaper to buy than it is to rent. The next one on the list, an auto loan, that's kind of grayish. As and, and Again, you want to make sure that the loan doesn't last longer than the car. Um, my daughter told me kind of a tragic story of one of her friends at work. She bought a nice new car and didn't get replacement cost insurance and car was totaled and she was offered less than the debt on the car because she levered the entire vehicle. Getting worse, vacation loans. Anytime you're borrowing money for a consumable, I think that's getting a little darker and a little grayer. Although apparently in the United Kingdom, borrowing for a vacation is very popular and then you pay it off and then you take out another loan to take your next vacation. Credit card advances. Credit card balances are at 19%. So remember, you can get, if you know you're always carrying a balance, get a different credit card. You can get that uh, interest reduced from 19% um, down to 10.99% last time I looked. You think credit cards are bad? Department store credit cards, like your brick card, things like that, they carry an interest rate of 30%. And one of the tricks that they'll use is they'll say, no money down, no money until 2025. Well, what they do is they sell the paper and you have to take out a credit card to get that. They sell the paper. And then if you don't pay the money back, they accrue the interest, but then they offer you a high interest loan because you don't have the money to pay them back. And you're going to continue to pay for that sofa for a long time. Be really careful. As my daddy used to say, if it sounds too good to be true, it's obviously a lie. And finally, payday loans. They're dead, dark, deep loans. And those loans spiral so quickly, it doesn't take very long before you owe more in interest than you do in principle. I'm sorry, I went just a little bit over time. Our next session, I'm going to talk about um, taxes and basic investments. And I'm also going to bring in the tax sheltering. So RSPs, TFSAs, things like that. But I want to give you a fundamental uh, or a base understanding of the income tax system. Any questions on anything we've covered? I'm going to stop sharing because I'm tired of sharing. Well, next time I will end with what I used to end with all the time, which was I'm going over to the Dublin for a beer. <laughs> if anybody'd like to join me, they're more than welcome to. Unfortunately, we, uh, well, I'm not even in Whistler right now, so uh, I shall not be going.
to the Dublin for a beer. Any questions? Again, feel free to email me if you've got one. So without further ado, I'm going to say thank you. Good night. Tell your friends. And uh, I'll turn it back to Jeanette. Jeanette, thank you very much for having me. Thanks, Bill. Always a pleasure. Um, and as as Bill just said, tell your friends. Um, we are recording the session this evening, so I can pass on the recording and the notes to folks who missed um, tonight. Everyone will be receiving the notes, by the way, so fear not. Um, and like Bill said, we are going to have the option to meet in person next month. We will, of course, give folks the option to attend virtually as well. Um, I will nudge you about that in my email to you so you can let me know your preference. Um, so no, don't, don't feel like you'll be excluded if you're still uh, wanting to come on Zoom next month. Um, Bill's email address is in the notes, so you will be able to bug him <laughs> after the fact if you come up with a question um, or go find him at the Dublin at some point. <laughs> but um, otherwise, we hope to see everybody on uh, Wednesday, March 16th, one month exactly from tonight, um, either at the library or on Zoom, uh, same time and we'll learn more together. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody. Have a good night. See you next time. Thank you, bye. Bye. <laughs>